Welcome to Reeducated TV, where we keep you informed. In this lesson, we will explore and establish who were the people called the Hebrews or Israelites, their origin and migrations. We will also establish the origin of the Phoenicians, whom were also considered to be Hebrews. We will be reading the Anacalypsis Volume 1 by Godfrey Higgins Esquire. The Anacalypsis is one of the greatest books written and published. The author's quest for knowledge, the truth of the past, and 20 years of genuine research is evident in his work. The Anacalypsis rips myth apart and leaves it in shambles. The book is a analysis of the history of the world through various work done prior. Mr. Higgins set out to prove the origins of religions and myths, among other issues of history, of which he did an honest and excellent job. The Anacalypsis, Volume 1, The Sciatic Isis, or an inquiry into the origins of languages, nations, and religions by Godfrey Higgins Esquire. We will be reading chapter 4, page 51, Two Ancient Ethiopias, Great Black Nation in Asia, the Buddha of India and Negro, the Arabians were Kushites, Memnon, Shepherd Kings, Hindus and Egyptians similar, Syria peopled from India. And it says, in taking a survey of the human inhabitants of the world, we find two classes distinguished from each other by a clear and definite line of demarcation, the black and white colors of their skins. This distinguishing mark we discover to have existed in ages the most remote. If we suppose them all to have descended from one peer, the question arises, was that peer black or white? If I were at present to say that I thought them black, I should be accused of fondness for paradox, and I should find as few persons to agree with me as the African Negroes do when they tell Europeans that the devil is white, and yet no one except a West India planter will deny that the poor Africans have reasons on their side. However, I say not that they were black, but I shall, in the course of this work, produce a number of extraordinary facts, which will be quite sufficient to prove that a black race in very early times had more influence over the affairs of the world than has been lately suspected, and I think I shall show by some very striking circumstances yet existing that the effects of this influence have not entirely passed away. So, Mr. Higgins is clearly letting you know that a black race in early times had more influence over the affairs of the world than has been lately suspected. Now I have already shown you that influence in so many ways from remote times up to the 18th to 19th centuries. It was the opinion of Sir William Jones that a great nation of blacks formerly possessed the dominion of Asia and held the seat of empire at Sidon. These must have been the people called by Mr. Maurice Cushites or Cuthites described in Genesis and the opinion that they were blacks is corroborated by the translators of the Pentateuch called the Seventy constantly rendering the word Kush by Ethiopia. It is very certain that, if this opinion be well founded, we must go for the time when this empire flourished to a period anterior to all our regular histories. It can only be known to have existed from accidental circumstances, which have escaped amidst the ruins of empires and the wrecks of time. Of this nation, we have no account, but it must have flourished after the deluge, and as our regular chronological systems fill up the time between the flood and what is called known and doubted history, 
if it be allowed to have existed, its existence will of course prove that no dependence can be placed on the early parts of that history. It will show that all the early chronology is false, for the story of this empire is not told, okay? So some of those written works and written sources are false. It is certain that its existence can only be known from insulated circumstances collected from various quarters and combining to establish the fact. But if I succeed in collecting a sufficient number to carry conviction to an impartial mind, the empire must be allowed to have existed. Let's take a brief look on the religion of Buddha as it is a great part of the puzzle. In fact, the first piece which we will cover in future videos. The religion of Buddha of India is well known to have been very ancient. In the most ancient temples scattered throughout Asia, where his worship is yet continued, he is found black as jet with the flat face, thick lips and curly hair of the Negro. Several statues of him may be met with in the museum of the East India Company. There are two exemplars of him brooding on the face of the deep upon a coiled serpent. To what time are we to allot this Negro? He will be proved to have been prior to the god called Krishna. He must have been prior to our contemporaneous with the black empire supposed by Sir William Jones to have flourished at Sidon or Sidon. The religion of this Negro god is found by the ruins of his temples and other circumstances to have been spread over an immense extent of country, even to the remotest parts of Britain, and to have been professed by devotees inconceivably numerous. I have very much doubt whether Christianity at this day is professed by more persons than yet profess the religion of Buddha. Of this, I shall say more thereafter. We see that the religion of Buddha in India is very ancient and can be found scattered throughout Asia where his worship is yet continued. Here we have several images of the Buddha from ancient times from various places in Asia. As you can see, the images are jet black as stated by Mr. Higgins. There was also mention of a black empire that flourished in Sudan and that they stretched across an immense extent of country, even to the remotest parts of Britain, where you had the Kimri Britons, Gardellians and others. Let's continue. When several cities, countries or rivers at great distances from each other are found to be called by the same name, the coincidence cannot be attributed to accident, but some specific cause for such an effect must be looked for. Thus, we have several cities called Heliopolis, or the city of the sun, the reason for which is sufficiently obvious. Thus, again, there were several Alexandrias, and on close examination, we find two Ethiopias alluded to in ancient history, one above the higher or southern part of Egypt, and the other somewhere to the east of it, and as it has been thought in Arabia, the people of this latter are called Cushim in the Hebrew text of the Old Testament and Ethiopianus by the text of the Septuagint or the Seventy. That they cannot have been the Ethiopians of Africa is evident from a single passage where they are said to have invaded Judah in the days of Asa under Zerah their king or leader, but the Lord smote the Cushim and Asa and the people that were with him pursued them unto Gerar and the Ethiopians were overthrown and they, that is Asa and his people, smote all the cities round about Gerar, whence it plainly follows that the Cushim here mentioned were such as inhabited 
the parts adjoined to Gerar and consequently not any part of the African Ethiopia but Arabia. In short, the reason for several cities, countries or rivers at great distances from each other sharing the same names is obvious. All these places were inhabited by the same people or some tribe of them. We find that there were two Ethiopias, one above or the southern part of Egypt and the other somewhere to the east of it. We will now see that the Ethiopia mentioned in the scriptures were referring to the people of Arabia and not the lot of Simeon in the west because the Ethiopians in the west were called Ludim and the Ethiopians of Arabia were called Cushites. We are now on chapter 2, section 5, page 53, and it says, When it is said that Asa smote the Cushites or Ethiopians in number a million of soldiers as far as Gerar and despoiled all the cities round about, it is absurd to suppose that the Gerar in the lot of the tribe of Simeon is meant. The expression all the cities and the million of men cannot apply to the little town of that tribe, probably the city in Wilkinson's atlas in the Tubula Orientalis at the side of the Persian Gulf which is called Gerar, is the city meant by the word Gerar and that Saba was near where it is placed by Dr. Stuckley or somewhere in the peninsula now called Arabia. In 2 Chronicle 21 verse 16 it is said and of the Arabians that were near the Ethiopians. This again shows that the Ethiopians were in the peninsula or bordered on it to the eastwards. They could not have lived to the west because the whole land of Egypt lay between them if they went by land and the Red Sea lay between the two nations westwards. In Habakkuk 3 volume 7 the words Midian and Kushan are used as synonyms I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. It is said in Numbers 12 verse 1, And Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman, Kunt. It appears that this Ethiopian woman was the daughter of Jethro, priest of Midian, near Horeb in Arabia. So all evidence points to Arabia so far. Dr. Wells has justly observed that the Kush spoken of in scripture is evidently Arabia from Numbers 12 verse 1 just cited and that it is also certain from Exodus 2 verses 15 to 21 that the wife of Moses was a Midianitish woman and it is proved that Midian or Madian was in Arabia from Exodus 3 verse 1 etc. Consequently, the Kush here spoken of and called Ethiopia must necessarily mean Arabia. He also proves from Ezekiel chapter 29 verse 10 that when God says he will make the land desolate from the Tower of Syen to the borders of Ethiopia, Kush, he cannot mean an African Kush because he evidently means from one boundary of Egypt to the other and as Syene is the southern boundary between the African Ethiopia and Egypt. It cannot possibly be that he speaks of the former but of the other end of Egypt which is Arabia. These scriptures are clearly referring to the Arabians. The circumstance of the translators of the Septuagint version of the Pentateuch having rendered the word Cush by the word Ethiopia is a very decisive proof that the theory of two Ethiopias is well founded. Let the translators have been who they may. It is totally impossible to believe that they could be so ignorant as to suppose that the African Ethiopia could border on the Euphrates or that the Cushites could be African Ethiopians. From all the accounts which modern travelers give of the country above Syene, 
there does not appear either from ruins or any other circumstance reason to believe that it was ever occupied by a nation strong enough to fight the battles and make the great figure in the world which we know the people called Cushites or Ethiopians did at different times. The valley of the Nile is very narrow, not capable of containing a great and powerful people. Sheba and Saba were either one or two cities of the Cushites or Ethiopians, and Pliny or Pliny says that the Sabians extended from the Red Sea to the Persian Gulf, thus giving them the whole of Arabia one part of which it is well known is called from its fertility of soil and salubrity of climate felix or the happy right remember that name the happy it is said that the ancient egyptians say that they originated from ethiopia where the god happy dwells or resides which proves they journeyed from the east and not the south today's Ethiopia. In other words, they journeyed from Hindustan. Let's continue. Dr. Wells states that the Ethiopians of Africa alone are commonly called Ludin, both by ancients and modern writers, but the country east of the Euphrates was called Kush, as well as the country west of it, thus giving the capital of Persia, Susan or Susiana which was said to be built by Memnon to the Cushites or Ethiopians, as well as Arabia. Mr. Free, in his vocabulary, gives the word Kus as a word whose meaning is unknown, but the Septuagint tells us it meant black. Mr. Hyde shows that it was a common thing for the Chaldeans to substitute the Ta for the Shin, thus Kut for Kus. Thus, in their dialect, the Kuthites were the same as the Kushites. If my reader will examine all the remaining passages of the Old Testament, not cited by me, where the words Ethiopia and Ethiopians are used, he will see that many of them can by no possibility relate to the African Ethiopia. So we have clearly established so far that there were two Ethiopias and that a great black race journeyed from the Indus into Arabia and other regions. No, there are many cave murals of India that proves their existence. As you can see in these depictions, the people of this era in India and Asia were black and they were the ones that peopled all of Asia, Africa, Arabia, etc. Eusebius states the Ethiopians to have come and settled in Egypt in the time of Amemnophis. According to this account, as well as to the account given by Philostratus, there was no such country as Ethiopia beyond Egypt until this invasion. According to Eusebius, these people came from the river Indus and planted themselves to the south of Egypt in the country called from them Ethiopia. The circumstance named by Eusebius that they came from the Indus at all events implies that they came from the east and not from the south and would induce a person to suspect them of having crossed the Red Sea from Arabia. They must either have done this or have come round the northern end of the Red Sea by the Isthmus of Suez, but they certainly could not have come from the present Ethiopia. But there are several passages in ancient writers which prove that Eusebius is right in his saying, not only that they came from the east, but from a very distant or very eastern part. Herodotus says that there were two Ethiopian nations, one in India, the other in Egypt. He derived his information from the Egyptian priest, a race of people who must have known the truth, and there seems no reason either for them or Herodotus to have misstated the fact, right? So the Egyptians said they came from the Indus, and Herodotus also confirms 
that they came from the Indus. Philostratus says that the gymnosophist of Ethiopia who settled near the sources of the Nile descended from the Brahmins of India. Having been driven thence for the murder of their king, this Philostratus says he learned from an ancient Brahmin called Jarkas. According to Philostratus, the people that settled near the sources of the Nile descended from the ancient Brahmins of India. He also mentions that they were driven out for the murder of the king. In the Irish and Scottish annals, it speaks of the Gadelians who were driven out of Scythia for the murder of the Scythian king. When Shu went into Scythia under Heber Scott, Shu is a descendant of Neul, whose father was Feni Usa Farsa, king of Scythia, which proves that they all were Scythians that came into Egypt at different eras or times. Let's continue. Another ancient writer, Eustathius, also states that the Ethiopians came from India. These conquering accounts can scarcely be doubted, and here may be discovered the mood and time also when great numbers of ancient rites and ceremonies might be imported from India into Egypt, for that there was a most intimate relation between them in very ancient times cannot be doubted. Indeed, it is not doubted. The only question has been whether Egypt borrowed from India or India from Egypt. All probability is clearly for a thousand reasons in favor of the superior antiquity of India, as Bailey and many other learned men have shown, a probability which seems to be reduced to a certainty by Herodotus, the Egyptians themselves and the other authors just now quoted. There is not a particle of proof from any historical records known to the author that any colony ever passed from Egypt to India, but there is, we see, direct positive historical evidence of the Indians having come to Africa. No attention can be paid to the idle stories of the conquest of India by Bacchus or Bacchus, who was merely an imaginary personage. In short, the god Saul, Bacchus or Bacchus, was a imaginary person that represented the sun like many others such as Zeus, Hercules, Heru, in Greek Horus, and so forth, and can be found in many cultures across the world. Dr. Shuckford gives an opinion that Homer and Herodotus are both right, and that they were two Ethiopias, and that the Africans came from India. So many ancient sources that tell us that the Africans, Kush and others were from the Indus. We are now on section 7, page 55, and it says, The bishop of Avranches thinks he has found three provinces of the name of Kush, Ethiopia, Arabia, and Susiana. They were three Ethiopias, that is, countries of blacks, not three Kushes. And this is perfectly consistent with what Mr. M. Bochart has maintained, that Ethiopia of Africa is not named Cush in any place of scripture. And this is also consistent with what is said by both Homer and Herodotus. The bishop shows clearly that the ancient Susiana is the modern Kushistan or Elam of which Susa was the capital. Here, on the walls of Egypt, you have a depiction of a Libyan, Syrian, and a Nubian or Ethiopian, a perfect example of the three Ethiopians. But it is key to note that he maintains that the three Ethiopians means three regions that were inhabited by blacks, Hindustan, Susiana, which is Arabia, and Libya. 
there were never three Cushes because Ethiopia of Africa was never named Cush. The famous Memnon, probably the son, was said to be the son of Aurora. But Aeschylus informs us that Sisiin was the mother of Memnon, and to him the foundation of Susa is attributed, and its citadel was called Memnonium, and it served the city of Memnon. This is the Memnon who was said to have been sent to the siege of Troy, and to have been slain by Achilles, and who was also said by the ancient authors to be an Ethiopian or a black. It seems the Egyptians supposed that this Memnon was their king Amenophis. The Ethiopians are stated by Herodotus to have come from the Indus, according to what modern chronologers deduce from his words. About the year 1615 BC, about 400 years after the birth of Abraham in 1996 BC, and about a hundred years before Moses rebelled against the Egyptians and brought the Israelites out of Egypt. That's the famous Memnon, who may or may not have actually existed and could have possibly been a representation of the sun. Palaces were built in his favor in Egypt, Thebes, and Susa, and to him was erected the famous statue in Thebes. Palaces were shown which belonged to this Memnon at Thebes and other places in Egypt, as well as at Susa, which from him were called in both places Memnoniums, and to him was erected the famous statue at Thebes, which is alleged to have given out a sound when first struck by the rays of the morning sun. Bishop Hewitt thinks, probably very correctly, that this statue was made in imitation of similar things which the Jewish traveller Rabbi Benjamin found in the country where the descendants of Cush adore the sun, and this he shows to be the country of which he speak. It lies about Bosors, where the Sabians are found in the greatest numbers, and who are the people of whom he speaks. The bishop thinks this Memnon cannot have been a Menophis because he lived very many years before the siege of Troy, in which he is said to have been an actor. It seems to me to be as absurd to look to Homer or Virgil for the chronology of historical facts as to Shakespeare, Milton, or any other epic poet. These poems may state facts but nothing of a historical or chronological kind can be received without some collateral evidence in confirmation. It never was supposed to be incumbent on any epic poet to tie himself down to mere historical matters of fact, and wherever it is evident, either from the admission of a later historical author or from any other circumstance, that he is relating facts from the works of the poets without any other authority. He can be as little depended upon as they can. The bishop has shown that the accounts of modern authors, George Sincellus, Suedas, Pausanias, Dionysus, Perigetes, and so forth, etc., are full of contradictions that they are obliged to suppose two Memnons all this arises from these persons treating the poem of Homer as a history instead of a poem. We shall never have an ancient history worthy of the pursual of men of common sense till we cease treating poems as history and send back such personages as Hercules, Theseus, Bacchus, and so forth to the heavens whence their history is taken and whence they never descended to the earth, right? So Mr. Higgins is clearly letting you know that those names and many other names along with their stories are false. We will definitely explore those names and myths and what they really signify or represent. Now, these myths 
stories, fairy tales, poems span across the world and has somehow replaced history. It is not meant to be asserted that these epic poems may not be of great use to a historian. It is only meant to protest against their being held as authority by themselves when opposed either to other histories or to known chronology. This case of Memnon is in point. Homer wanted a hero to fill up his poem, and without any regard to date or anything wrong in so doing, he accommodated the history to his poem, making use of a Menophis or Memnon or the religious tradition, whichever it was, as he thought proper. These poems may also be of great use as evidence of the customs and manners of the times, both of when they were written and previously, and very often of dry, unconnected facts, which may turn out to be of consequence. Thus Virgil makes Memnon black, as does also Pindar, that Pindar and Virgil were right. The features of the bust of Memnon in the British Museum prove for they are evidently those of the Negro. This image is said to be the bust of Memnon, and the image clearly has black or Negroid features, so Pindar and Virgil were right. It is probable that the Memnon here spoken of, if there ever were such a man, was the leader of the shepherds, who are stated by Manitha, and other historians to have come from the east and to have conquered Egypt. The learned Dr. Shukford thinks that the troubles caused in Egypt by the shepherd kings appear to have happened about the time the Jews left it under Moses. He places these events between the death of Joseph and the birth of Moses, and he supposes that the Jews left the country in consequence of the oppressions of these shepherd kings, it is very clear that much confusion has arisen in this part of the ancient history from these eastern shepherds having been confounded with the Israelites and also from facts relating to one having been attributed to the other. Josephus takes the different accounts to relate to the same people. This is attended with great difficulty. The shepherds are said by Manetha after a severe struggle with the old inhabitants, to have taken refuge in a city called Avaris, or Avaris, or Abaris, where they were a long time besieged, and whence at last they departed, 240,000 in number, together with their wives and children, in consequence of capitulation into the deserts of Syria. So that's the confusion we have to constantly deal with in history. So many contradicting information that leads us nowhere. Now we will establish the shepherd kings, the people they call the Israelites and the Phoenicians, whom were all the same people that migrated from Hindustan at different times. If there were two races of people who have been confounded together, one of which came from India and overran Arabia, Palestine and Egypt and brought hence their religion to the Egyptians and was in color black, it must have come in a very remote period. This may have been the race of shepherd kings of whom Josephus speaks when he says they oppressed the Israelites. But the assertion of Josephus can hardly have been true, for they must have been expelled long before the Israelites came. The second race were the Arabian shepherd tribe, called captives, who, after being settled some time in the land of Goshen, were driven or went out into the open country of Arabia. They at last, under the command of Joshua, conquered Palestine and finally settled there. Bishop Cumberland has proved that there was a dynasty of Phoenician shepherd kings who were driven out 300 years before Moses. These seem to have been the black or Ethiopian Phoenician Memonites. 
they may have exactly answered to this description, but to his date of 300 years, I pay no attention. Further than that, it was a great length of time. There was a race of black Phoenician shepherd kings that came from the Indus and overran Arabia, Palestine and Egypt in a very remote period in time and they could not have oppressed the Israelites because the first shepherd kings were expelled from Egypt long before the Israelites came. We also see that the second people were the Arabian shepherd tribe who were driven out or left under the command of Joshua and settled in Palestine and Mr. Higgins places the time of both tribes at a greater length of time than 300 years. Josephus says that the copies of Manetha differed, that in one the shepherds were called captives, not kings, and that he thinks this is more agreeable to ancient history, that Manetha also says the nation called shepherds were likewise called captives in their sacred books, and that after they were driven out of Egypt, they journeyed through the wilderness of Syria and built a city in Judea, which they called Jerusalem. Josephus says that Manetho was an Egyptian by birth, but that he understood Greek in which he wrote his history, translating it from the old Egyptian records. If the author understand Mr. Faber rightly in his Hore Mosaic, he is of opinion that the shepherd kings were Israelites. The accounts of these two tribes of people are confused, as many naturally be expected, but there are certainly many striking traits of resemblance between them. Mr. Shockford, with whom in this Mr. Volney agrees, thinks there were two races of shepherd kings, and in this opinion he coincides with most of the ancients, but most certainly in his treatise against Apian or Apian and the meaning of treatise is a written work dealing formally or systematically with a subject. Josephus only names one. We shall have much to say hereafter respecting these shepherds under the name of Pali. So all sources agree that there were two tribes of shepherds. Some say they were both shepherd kings and others say the second tribe were called captives. The only objection which occurs against Amenophis or Memnon being the leader of the Hindu race who first came from the Indus to Egypt is that, according to our ideas of his chronology, he could scarcely be sufficiently early to agree with the known historical records of India. But our chronology is in so very vague and uncertain a state that very little dependence can be placed upon it and it will never be any better till learned men search for the truth and fairly state it instead of sacrificing it to the idle legends or allegories of the priest which cannot by any possible ingenuity be made consistent even with themselves mr wilsford in his treatise on egypt and the nile in the asiatic researches informs us that many very ancient statues of the god of Buddha in India have crisp curly hair with flat noses and thick lips and adds nor can it be reasonably doubted that a race of Negroes formerly had power and preeminence in India. This is what has become of history, fairy tales, idle legends or allegories by priests and learned men that have put beliefs, religions, and personal agendas before the truth, and as stated by Mr. Higgins, it will never be better until learned men search for the truth and fairly state it. Let's continue. This is confirmed by Mr. Maurice, who says the figures in the Hindu caverns are of a very different character from the present race of Hindus. Their countenances are broad and full, the nose flat, and the lips, particularly the underlips, remarkably thick. This is again confirmed by Colonel Fitzclarence in the journal of his journey from India, and Maurice in the first volume of his Indian Antiquities states 
that the figures in the caves in India and in the temples in Egypt are absolutely the same as given by Bruce, Neymar, Niebuhr and so forth. Justin states that the Phoenicians being obliged to leave their native country in the east, they settled first near the Assyrian lake, which is the Persian Gulf, and Maurice says we find an extensive district named Palestine to the east of the Euphrates and Tigris. The word Palestine seems derived from Palis Than, the seat of the palace or shepherds. This confirms Sir William Jones's opinion in a striking manner respecting a black race having reigned at Sudan. Yet again, it has been confirmed by Mr. Maurice, Colonel Fitzclarence and others that the figures in the Hindu caves are of a different character from the present race of Hindu. He goes on further to say that their countenances are broad and full, flat noses and thick lips. There was also mention of the Phoenicians leaving their native country in the east and settled first near the Assyrian lake, which is the Persian Gulf, and confirms that there was a great black race that reigned at Sidon. It seems to me that great numbers of circumstances are producible and will be produced in the following work to prove that the mythology of Egypt were derived from India, but which persons who are of a different opinion endeavor to explain away as inconclusive proofs. They, however, produce few or no circumstances tending towards the proof of the contrary, that India borrowed from Egypt to enable the friends of the superior antiquity of India in their turn to explain away or disprove, right? There is so much evidence which shows that India came into Africa and that the mythologies of Egypt were derived from India. So is it a case of not knowing or failure to accept the truth? It is a well-known fact that our Hindu soldiers, when they arrived in Egypt in the late war, recognized the gods of their country in the ancient temples, particularly their god Krishna. The striking similarity, indeed identity, of the style of architecture and the ornaments of the ancient Egyptians and Hindu temples, Mr. Maurice has proved beyond all doubts. He says travelers who have visited Egypt in periods far more recent than those in which the above cited authors journeyed thither confirm the truth of their relation in regard both to the number and extent of the excavations, the beauty of the sculptures and their similitude to those carved in the caverns of India. The final result, therefore, of this extended investigation is that in the remotest periods there has existed a most intimate connection between the two nations and that colonies emigrated from Egypt to India or from India to Egypt transported their deities into the country in which they respectively took up their abode. This testimony of the Reverend Mr. Maurice's is fully confirmed by Sir W. Jones who says the remains of architecture and sculpture in India, which I mention here as mere monuments of antiquity, not as specimens of ancient art, seem to prove an early connection between this country and Africa. The pyramids of Egypt, the colossal statues described by Pausanias and others, the Sphinx and the Hermes Canis, which last bears a great resemblance of the Varan Avatar, or the incarnation of Vishnu in the form of a boar, indicate the style and mythology of the same indefatigable workmen who formed the vast excavations of Kanara, the various temples and images of Buddha, and the idols which are continually dug up at Gaia or in its vicinity. The letters on many of those monuments appear, as I have before intimated, partly of Indian and partly of Abyssinian or Ethiopic origin, 
and all these indubitable facts may induce no ill-founded opinion that Ethiopia and Hindustan were peopled or colonized by the same extraordinary race. They assure us once more that Ethiopia and Hindustan were colonized by the same people and that the letters on many monuments appear partly Indian, Abyssinian or Ethiopic origin, same extraordinary race, in confirmation of which it may be added that the mountaineers of Bengal and Bahar can hardly be distinguished in some of their features, particularly their lips and noses, from the modern Abyssinians, whom the Arabs call the children of Kush, and the ancient Hindus, according to Strabo, differed in nothing from the Africans, but in the straightness and smoothness of their hair, while that of the others was crisp or woolly, a difference proceeding chiefly, if not entirely, from the respective humidity or dryness of their atmospheres. Hence, the people who received the first light of the rising sun, according to the limited knowledge of the ancients, are said by Apulus to be the Ari or the Ethiopians, by which he clearly meant certain nations of India, where we frequently see figures of Buddha with curled hair, apparently designed for a representation of it in its natural state. All these people were the same within their features and their complexion. The only slight difference was their hair, where one was said to be straight and smooth and the other crisp and woolly. The Africans and Indians were one people separated by time. Again, Sir W. Jones says, Mr. Bruce and Mr. Bryant have proved that the Greeks gave the appellation of Indians to the nations of Africa and to the people among whom we now live. I shall account for this in the following work, which we will definitely get into, because they may have journeyed from Africa to other places, but they originated from Hindustan. Mons de Guinness maintains that the inhabitants of Egypt in very old times had unquestionable a common origin with the old natives of India, as is fully proved by their ancient monuments and the affinity of their languages and institutions, both political and religious, many circumstances confirming the above, particularly with respect to the language, will be pointed out hereafter. We have already established so far that there were three Ethiopias, meaning three countries of blacks, one in India, the other in Arabia, and one in Libya. Now we will further establish the true origins of the Ethiopians, Arabians, and Libyans, also the origins of the Phoenician shepherd kings, or Hebrew Israelites. It is curious to observe the ingenuity exercised by Sir W. Jones to get over obstacles which oppose themselves to his theological creed, which he has previously determined nothing shall persuade him to disbelieve. He says, we are told, that the Phoenicians, like the Hindus, adored the sun and asserted water to be the first of created things, nor can we doubt that Syria, Samaria, and Phoenice, or the long strip of land on the shore of the Mediterranean, were anciently peopled by a branch of the Indian stock, but were afterwards inhabited by that race which, for the present, we call Arabian. Here we see he admits that the ancient Phoenicians were Hindus. Okay? They originated from Hindustan. They might have journeyed across the world as they were sea goers. Let's continue. He then goes on to observe that in all three the oldest religion was the Assyrian, as it is called by Selden, and the Samaritan letters appear to have been the same at first with those of Phenis. No, with respect to which was the oldest religion, as their religions were all, at the bottom, precisely the same 
that is the worship of the sun there is a strong probability that the earliest occupiers of the land the hindus were the founders of the solar worship as the contrary so the phoenicians were from a more far eastern part of the indus in a future video i will explain what is meant by which religion is the oldest and all being the same the worship of the sun when the various circumstances and testimonies which have been detailed are taken into consideration there can be scarcely any doubt left on the mind of the reader that by the word ethiopia two different countries have been meant this seems to be perfectly clear and it is probable that by an ethiopian a negro correctly speaking may have been meant not merely a black person and it seems probable that the following may have been the real fact that is a race either of negroes or blacks but probably of the former came from india to the west occupying or conquering and forming a kingdom on the two banks of the euphrates the eastern ethiopia alluded to in numbers chapter 12 that they advanced forwards occupying syria phoenicia arabia and egypt that they or some tribe of them were the shepherd kings of egypt that after a time the natives of egypt rose against them and expelled part of them into abyssinia or ethiopia another part of them into adumia or syria or arabia and another part into the african desert of libya where they were called lubim with all the evidence provided it is quite clear that the ancient libyans ethiopians and arabians migrated from india bringing their culture language and architecture which can be found across the world the time at which these people came to the west was certainly long previous to the exodus of the israelites from egypt but how long previous to that event must remain doubtful no system of chronology can be admitted as evidence every known system is attended with too many difficulties perhaps chronology may be allowed to instruct us in relation to facts as to which preceded or followed but certainly nothing more no chronological date can be depended on previous to the capture of babylon by cyrus whether we can depend upon it quite so far back seems to admit of doubt right their timeline of history has many doubts part of the ancient monuments of egypt may have been executed by these people the memnoniums found in persia and in egypt leave little room to doubt this in favor of this hypothesis all ancient sacred and profane historical accounts agree and poetical works of imagination cannot be admitted to compete as evidence with the works of serious historians like herodotus this hypothesis likewise reconciles all the accounts which at first appear discordant but which no other will do it is also confirmed by a considerable quantity of circumstantial evidence it is therefore presumed by the writer he may safely assume in his forthcoming discussions that there were two ethiopias one to the east of the red sea the other to the west of it and that a very great nation of blacks from india did rule over almost all asia in a very remote era in fact beyond the reach of history or any of our records right so all those monuments around the world were built by these shepherd kings and there is no real timeline to determine the era the first shepherd kings journeyed to africa and subsequently the rest of the world this and what has been observed respecting judicial astrology will be retained in the recollection by my reader they will both be found of great importance in our future inquiries in my essay on the celtic druids i have shown that a great nation called Celtae, of whom the druids were the priests 
spread themselves almost over the whole earth and are to be traced in their rude gigantic monuments from India to the extremity of Britain. Who these can have been but the early individuals of the black nations of whom we have been treating, I know not. Those of you who have watched my video, The Atlanteans of the British Isles, you will know that the ancient Britons never referred to themselves as Celt. However, the history of Mr. Higgins corroborates with the history of Ireland and Scotland, where the shepherd kings migrated from Africa and Scythia and inhabited the British Isles at different times, where many cities and monuments were built. In the Irish annals, it mentions one called Briogan that built many castles which were called Briga. Okay, let's continue. And in this opinion, I am not singular. The learned Maurice says, Kuthites, that is Celts, built the great temples in India and Britain and excavated the caves of the former. And the learned mathematician Reuben Burrow has no hesitation in pronouncing Stonehenge to be a temple of the black curly-headed Buddha. So, Stonehenge and other monuments were not built by aliens, giants or such myths, but was actually built by the early inhabitants of the British Isles, whom were the shepherd kings, Gadelians and Fomorians, and as mentioned by Mr. Maurice and Mr. Higgins, that Stonehenge represented the black curly-headed Buddha, whose image was the first double nature of the sun. I shall leave the further consideration of this black nation for the present. I shall not detain my reader with any of the numerous systems of the Hindus, the Persians, the Chaldeans, Egyptians or other nations, except in those particular instances which immediately relate to the object of this work, in the course of which I shall often have occasion to recur to what I have here said, and shall also have opportunities of supporting it by additional evidence. Just to be clear to those of us who might have missed it, the people they call the Israelites were the second shepherd tribe that came into Egypt and later were driven out where they dispersed into Palestine and later migrated to Scythia and Britain and the rest of the world. In short, we are all the same people, separated by names and titles. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Take care.